Okay, now this is about realism. Uh, I just made a video about the different artistic movements of the late 1700s to early 1900s that you're gonna be responsible for. And now we're gonna look whoop, at realism, okay? And I gave you a PDF about it um, that's attached to your, um, attached to the Google Classroom form. And here, uh, I, similar to when we learned about romanticism or humanism uh, I, or Baroque art, I really want you to focus on the definition, okay? Realism, an artistic and literary movement from the 1840s to the 1890s characterized by observing and recording the stark and sordid reality of everyday modern life of the industrial era focused on the working class. All right, so what is what are some important words just in this definition? Okay, artistic and literary movement. Remember, artistic movements don't just mean paintings. It also means uh, writing. It can mean music as well. Um, so the arts, literature, poetry, um, observing and recording the stark reality. That's... Um, it's nothing is dressed up here. It is straight up reality. Um, the sordid, sordid also meaning it is is reality gonna look good for the industrial um, working class people? No, and these, the job of these artists is to show what reality looks like. When I usually describe this in class, I'll be playing NWA uh, straight out of Compton. And that album had a similar uh, effect um, on uh, people in the United States in the early 1990s in that it said, it said this is what's going on in the um, in South Central Los Angeles. This is what's going on in inner city uh, United States. Um, it's not pretty to look at uh, and this is reality and so deal with it. That's what realism does in the 1800s. It's saying there's an industrial revolution going on, but look at what's happening to the people. The people are suffering. And, um, and so uh, there are examples of it here. Uh, Charles Dickens is probably the most um, uh, famous example of realism. And uh, uh, think of uh, you know A Christmas Carol, uh, he wrote a lot about poor children in the industrial era, um, um, whether it's Tiny Tim on crutches or little chimney sweeps um, who are sweeping the the dirty um, chimneys and uh, getting lung diseases in, in England. And so here, this is, um, uh, instead of showing you Charles Dickens, which I hope you remember, uh, I'm showing you Emile Zola. And so and the purpose of me showing you this is that uh, to think of it's also happening in France. Why is it happening in France? Realism. Well, the industrial revolution is happening in France. And so artists are responding to that. And his book, Germinal, he's, here's just the first two pages of it. And I want you to read it in, uh, carefully and in depth. Um, but you can see right here um, a single. It's about a guy walking through pitch black um uh, countryside and a single idea occupies his head the empty head of a workman without work and without lodging the hope that the cold would be less keen after sunrise um, it's a someone who's suffering someone who wants to work someone who doesn't have work and is doing all he can to get it and so read that in depth um, and then um, let's see uh, and so Zola, the author, claimed to represent, quote, only life itself. But the vivid description in his prose often creates heavily dramatized effects. In this selection, why does Zola use such deeply poetic imagery? I took this question from the McKay textbook. Um, but if I were to ask this question, um, he's writing about, who is he writing about? He's writing about working class um, about the suffering of working class people, right? The stark reality, the suffering of working class people. He wants to expose the stark reality about suffering of working class people. And his job is to purpose, uh, I'm just gonna write per, purpose, expose, shoot, sorry, purpose, 
expose harsh reality. Harsh, or I'm gonna use that word from the definition, the stark reality of life for working class people, of working class life. And so that's his purpose, but why would he be using poetic imagery? Um, think about who is the intended audience of his, uh, of his writing. Is it working class people? No, working class people aren't gonna be educated. They're not gonna be able to read or write. So who are the, who's the intended audience? The intended audience is going to be the bourgeois, the wealthy. And there's a explosion of reading that happens in the late 1700s. And in these industrial societies, there's uh, for the wealthy or the bourgeois, there's more time to have entertainment. And one of those entertainments, besides dance halls, besides um, cafe culture, is, is literature and books. And so his intended audience are the bourgeois, or I'm gonna write literate, uh, bourg, oh, there's no E there, B-O-U-R-G-O-Z, literate bourgeoisie, um, people. And what is he doing to these literate bourgeoisie people? Well, he needs to do his job and entertain them and make it poetic. And so once he's entertaining them, then he can expose this stark reality of working class life. But that's an example of why um, he is writing with poetry. He has to, in order to get, to hook his crowd, the bourgeois, those bourgeois people, to then um, uh, expose them to the stark reality of working class life. And how does this compare to or contrast with romanticism? I'm going to let you figure that out. So think about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the Brothers Grimm's fairy tales. How does this differ from that? That's up to you to figure out. Okay. Um, an artist, a realism, is Honoré Daumier. He's French. And so it looks like Daumier. Daumier, and Daumier um, painted, uh, did cartoons as well as um, as paintings and oil paintings. And so I want you to be looking at this cartoon, it's called Gargantua, and in Daumier, he had two purposes or two types of paintings he did. And I'd like you to just focus on this up here, this definition in, in black about what Daumier did. His art championed the simple virtues of the urban working class. So the first thing, number one, championed or advocated, supported, held up the simple virtues of the urban working class. So it raised up the idea of working class people. It gave them honor and dignity. So simple virtues, this is like honor and dignity. Uh, his name is Honoré Daumier. That sort of looks like honor and dignity. Think of that, honor and dignity, Honoré Daumier. The virtues of urban working class. And then his second purpose of his art was to lampoon. Lampoon means to satirize, to make fun of, to ridicule the greed and ill will of the rich bourgeoisie. And so you can tell this man has, this artist has socialist tendencies, right? He's supporting the working class or the proletariat, and he is opposing the rich bourgeoisie. And how does he oppose the bourgeoisie? He makes fun of them. And in Gargantua, he does a great job of it. This painting is, or this cartoon is read from right to left. And so right over here, you have the, um, the poor working class people who are putting their money into, um, to be taxed by see this fat um, wealthy bourgeois person you can see the squalor of the industrial background behind them and then where are all their tax money going it's going up to the mouth of gargantua gargantua is this giant who's eating all their taxes eating their food and what is gargantua doing he's sitting on this um basically this chair is a toilet and he's pooping out he's defecating these laws, these bills, and where are the laws going? They're taken by these other bourgeoisie to the capital. And so um, quite a lampooning of the, um, 
of the bourgeois and of the government that is controlled and made in the same image as the bourgeois. Um, remember during the 1800s, voting rights were only given to people, uh, wealthy men with property. And so even though it relied on the, um, the sweat and the toil and the, um, the taxes of the masses of working class people, um, their governments uh, would just be working for themselves and passing, literally passing like uh, poop through uh, his body into these laws that um, are about as, wor uh, as worth as much as, as, as what he's saying to these people. All right, and then the, the final thing I'll show you um, is this right here. Um, so Honoré Daumier, the, uh, the, the artist, this is another example. This is called Third Class Carriage. And in this painting, so we just saw a cartoon he did, Third Class Carriage, does it champion the simple virtues of the working class? Or we can think of his name, Honoré Daumier, does it honor the dignity of the urban working class? Honor, dignity. And why am I saying honor, dignity? Um, because it, it helps me remember his name, Honoré Daumier. Is he honoring the dignity of the working class or is he lampooning the greed and ill will of the rich bourgeoisie or both? Why? Take a look at this. What do these, um, what do these people look like? Are these wealthy uh, bourgeoisie or are they um, urban working class? Does he paint them with uh, lampooning them or making fun of them? Or is it a way that, um, that honors their dignity or champions their simple virtues? Now that's up to you to, to decide. And then finally, we have a painting called A Man with a Hoe. Um, and it's not like if there were an NWA song called Man with a Hoe. Uh, this is literally a man with a hoe. Um, and, uh, and I'd like you to read about it here. Uh, why is this realist? Think of the definition of realism. Does it champion the simple virtues of the urban working class or does it lampoon the greed and ill will of the rich bourgeoisie? Um, how would this be reflective of working class or socialism during the time? How would this be a response to industrialization? I'd like you to um, look at it and read it and... Uh, and then uh, that's it. Uh, that should give you a, an idea of what realism is. And I want you to look at the Getty and the Norton Simon Museum and the Huntington Gallery and try to find some examples of, um, of realism in art during this, this movement about realist art. All right, thank you.